This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to my streaming video service Nebula when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. Well that sure was a Monaco Grand Prix. Eventually, wasn't it? We couldn't get started properly due to last minute rain and the need to react, electrical issues and ultimately weather too heavy for racing. And then we had further stoppage later on when Mick split his car against the wall. So in the end, we didn't get all the laps but we did get some racing and while it was pretty fun and interesting in some ways, it perhaps didn't make the best case for Monaco in a time when we're reflecting on its absolute necessity to be on the F1 calendar. But let's start simple with the timing issue and why we didn't get full running. As with Spa last year, where we got no real running at all due to a rainstorm, the race timer situation wasn't properly communicated to us at any point and we only got the true picture of things via the commentators about an hour after the official start time. F1 and the FIA really need to work on this problem. If things are going off book or races are delayed or suspended, you really need to let the viewers know what's going on as soon as possible. Even if it's just to let them know that the timings and official procedure are going to be amended and official information will be declared shortly. Just something to f make us feel like we understand. Even the commentator seems a little confused for a while. So here's how race timing works. Every race has an official start time scheduled. For Monaco it was 3pm local time. If all goes to plan, as soon as we tick over to the scheduled start time, normally indicated by the live feed focusing on that big Rolex clock as the minute hand swings to the hour, the formation lap begins and a three hour countdown begins. Now no matter what happens, there could be red flags, a delayed start, an earthquake, whatever, the race will finish three hours after the scheduled start time. This is for the benefit of the broadcasters to keep the race within a reasonably tight time slot, so the TV channel doesn't have to run over too late and cause issues with later programming. Now there's a second clock, the race clock. This timer is limited to just two hours and starts as soon as the normal race start procedure begins. Normally this is the formation lap, as with the 3 hour broadcast countdown. This second clock only counts the actual live on track action, so if the race is red flagged or delayed then this clock is suspended and restarted only when the cars are back on track, putting in laps. Now it still counts down during safety cars and stuff, it only stops for red flags. So in this case we had a delayed start, about an hour and 7 minutes past the scheduled start time. And then we had 49 minutes of running before the red flag for Schumacher, we were stopped for 20 minutes by which point we only had 44 minutes left. So even though the race clock had over an hour left to run, we were bound by the overall 3 hour limit. And so we only got 64 laps out of 77. And so let's look at that stoppage for Schumacher. It was visually a hell of an impact. He lost the rear end coming out of La Piscine and pirouetted on the slick tarmac into the barrier at the second chicane. Now these cars are heavy, mostly at the rear end, so the back end dug into the Tech Pro at just the right angle to create a levering effect that wrenched the gearbox from the rest of the chassis. Now ultimately cars coming to pieces like this is a good thing as the energy is directed into working on breaking up the car instead of going through the driver via sudden deceleration. So despite the visual demonstration of destruction, Schumacher easily walked away and off to the medical centre. But the car was in pieces at a dangerous part of the track and the barrier had been yoinked away from the Armco. It seemed like an obvious red flag but we went through this virtual safety car and then a full safety car period before they stopped the race which seemed weird when to all intents and purposes it felt obviously like a red flag situation. But with the race already well delayed it at least made some sense for the race directors to keep the race running under controlled safety car conditions while they checked with trackside staff to see if there was any possibility to get the situation cleared up without stopping the race. Ultimately the answer was no, but good to check. Nonetheless the virtual safety car was a bit odd. It seemed like definitely full safety car was the minimum call with so many marshals needed on track. One thing F1 does need to start discussing is red flag procedures. They take so long. I mean that is part of the reason why they tried to safety car Schumacher's crash. Once you throw a red flag you can't take it back and then to restart the race you need to go through a procedure that includes a 10 minute signal to the restart. So with getting back to the pit lane and getting the track cleared we're always looking at a minimum 15 minute stop for a red flag even if everything moves as quickly as possible. There's got to be a better way even if we remove from teams the ability to fiddle with the cars like they like to during a stoppage just to get this window down. As for the delayed start at the beginning of the race, it was a little controversial and I was a bit irked at the time but looking back I think it was just unfortunate timing and circumstance for the most part. 
The track looked set for a dry start, but then rain started rolling in with a few minutes to go, and this prompted a short delay to allow teams to switch over to wet or intermediate tyres, but at this point the rain wasn't too bad and the track was in reasonable shape. The race was delayed a little longer than was probably needed, and by the time we actually got going the rain was heavy and sending streams of water across the track. They tried running behind the safety car, but it was deemed far too wet for proper running. We then delayed for almost an hour before starting behind the safety car again, and we probably wouldn't have waited so long if the rain hadn't tripped some of the FIA's race systems and that included the start procedure and lights, which meant a fix had to be made to get things underway and a standing start was unavailable, hence why we kept having rolling starts. Now in theory, we could have done some running earlier on when the rain wasn't so bad and that would have kept a warm, drier line going as the heavier rain came in, which would have got us some racing laps for maybe 10 to 15 minutes early on, even if we ultimately did have to stop either way. But I do understand the FAA's need to err on the side of caution. Perhaps again a discussion needs to be had over where the line is on wet conditions and when drivers want to get going. Okay so the next big question a lot of people were asking which didn't get answered during the race which was why did Verstappen not get penalised for crossing the pit lane exit line? Both Verstappen and Perez were summoned to the stewards for this and while Perez was found not to have crossed the line at all, Verstappen's was more subtle. If you saw the footage or images from inside and outside the car, it was clear he definitely didn't keep his wheels inside the line. And traditionally that would have been an easy penalty. One of those slam dunk kind of deals like speeding in the pit lane. You can't really argue with a line. But interestingly, and something I hadn't fully realised, the pit lane exit rule changed last year. Previously, the rule in the International Sporting Code was any line painted on the track at the pit exit for the purposes of separating cars leaving the pits from those on track must not be crossed by any part of the car leaving the pits. Now this kind of language normally suggests that any part of the car, even a mere centimetre overhanging the line, would be deemed illegal. But it now reads, any tyre of a car exiting the pit lane must not cross any line painted on the track at the pit exit, etc. So Red Bull argued and won their case with the idea of saying that if the tyre has to cross the line, it must mean the whole tyre, not part of the tyre. And the stewards agreed with that, despite noting that, yeah, the front and rear wheels were partly across the line. So apparently, that is the rule now. You can go across the pit lane exit as long as your whole tyre doesn't go over. And that's good to know, but not the rule that we used to know. So Verstappen was fine with that move. And then finally, let's talk about why both Leclerc and Sainz not only lost this race, but somehow fumbled a seemingly easy victory and giving it away to Perez. I mean, I say giving it away to Perez. Perez took it with both hands. He had tremendous pace at the right time and he used it to perfectly outdrive them both despite doing an extra pit stop. So everyone had to start on full wet as a safety car start in wet conditions mandates this. But the track was drying so it would reach a phase where the intermediate was the fastest tyre and then ultimately a phase where the dry tyre would be faster than either of them. Sainz was extremely comfortable on the wet tyre but felt the dry conditions coming in fast so he wanted to skip the intermediate tyre entirely and go straight from full wets to dries. Which would have saved him about the 20 seconds it would take to do the extra pit stop. Perez, Verstappen and Leclerc all opted to do that extra stop for the Inter with Perez stopping first and immediately showing how much faster that tyre was. Here's a chart showing Sainz, Verstappen and Leclerc's lap times relative to the lap times of Perez. If the bars go up, they're slower than Perez. If the bars go down, they're faster than Perez. So up to lap 15, everyone is on wets and doing about the same kind of times. On lap 16, Perez pits and in doing so, loses about 16 seconds to everyone. But then look what happens next, compared to Sainz in particular. Lap 18, he gains 6.8 seconds to Sainz. Uh, the other two pit for Inters at this point. Lap 19, he gains 4.8 seconds on Sainz. Lap 20, another 2.9 seconds. Now at this point, Sainz pits for dry tyres and Perez is only two seconds behind him on track. He's already jumped Leclerc getting onto Inters earlier than him. Sainz loses 18 seconds to Perez in his pit stop, but now he's on dry tyres, something Perez will still have to do. But right now the track is still a bit better for the intermediate tyres, so Perez comes in the very next lap, but by being on Inters for that lap while Sainz was on cold dry tyres, Perez loses only 9 seconds to Sainz through his pit stop. He holds onto the net lead, it is game over. Ultimately switching to the intermediate tyre as early as you could was the faster strategy. 
Sainz called it wrong to try and hold on, and Ferrari called it wrong by not getting Leclerc in earlier and then called it wrong again by getting him onto dry tyres too early, giving Verstappen an extra lap against him on the warmed up Inters. And they did it while double stacking with Sainz for an extra delay. So Leclerc dropped from a pretty dominant lead to fourth place, losing about 12 seconds overall to Perez in just 10 laps. It can look like a tremendous blunder in hindsight, but Knowing when to move from a wet to an intermediate, from an intermediate to a dry, is something that comes with a lot of risk and no real information until someone tries it. Perez and Hamilton basically kicked off the intermediate phase by showing how fast it was, but Leclerc was sitting comfortably and could have thrown it all away by switching too early. Ferrari then tried to win it back again by switching early to the hard tyre, but were again in the wrong phase. They should have gone a little bit later. You know, I made a video once about Ferrari's strategy calls, years ago, and unfortunately it still holds up. Ferrari's only hope was to outmaneuver the Bulls by using the more durable hard tyre in that final part of the race, but alas, despite the hard holding more strongly than the medium, track position is key, and in fact Perez was able to dictate the pace fairly easily, even holding back to bring that lap count down before opening a little gap. Perez was the king of Monaco. And should Monaco still be on the F1 calendar? I mean, probably yes. It's a hell of a challenge and qualifying is still awesome. We do need to bring the cars back towards it, as right now they're not really suitable. But if we can put up with it being a little bit unsuitable for a few more years before maybe shrinking the cars a bit, then yeah, let's hang on to it. Or just change up the race a bit to make it work better. I had some outlandish ideas in this previous video that aren't that far-fetched. We break the rules for Monaco anyway, we don't even do full distance. So maybe let's make a Monaco that works. Or don't, whatever. Monaco could be facing extinction as competition from other street races in other financial capitals with their own marinas and mingling millionaires have crept into the calendar. It seems that desire from fans to keep Monaco is also waning noticeably, so maybe we should do something about that. And while the Monaco Grand Prix track turned out to be a terrible platform for streams, <sighs> this video's sponsors are some of the very best streaming platforms available for your buck. Curiosity Stream and Nebula. If you love videos like mine, where we all learn a little something, but have some fun along the way, where perhaps you get to the end of a video and think, that was interesting, I want a bit more of that kind of thing, then maybe you should consider checking out Nebula. Nebula is a streaming platform made by independent creators like me, so they can get together and create just really interesting, well-produced content that they really wanted to make and think that you'll want to watch. And if you're getting your teeth into all the talking points surrounding the ever-changing Formula 1 landscape, you'll probably love some of the creators like Real Engineering's videos on fascinating feats of, well, engineering. Uh, you'll like Isaac Arthur's videos covering the envelope where contemporary technology brushes against future sci-fi concepts. And hey, even real-life laws explorations of geopolitical complications are right at home with some of F1's ongoing stories. That's all I'll say. It's all ad-free and sponsor-free, so you can watch this exact video over there without me waffling on about how good Nebula is. On many channels, you'll even get to see bonus and extended episodes exclusive to Nebula, where content falls outside of that ideal YouTube algorithmically-induced window. And Nebula have long teamed up with CuriosityStream, that excellent big-budget behemoth of non-fiction films and series where you can extend your curiosity even further with content from their extensive library that includes Hot Roads, the world's most dangerous roads. And if you think F1 cars racing around Jeddah, Monaco and Baku is chaos, then your mind may truly be blown by this series looking into some of the most incredible streets, highways and passes on the planet. And if you want access to all of CuriosityStream and all of Nebula, then it's very simple and incredible value. Just sign up to CuriosityStream and you will get access to all of Nebula for free, as long as you're a CuriosityStream member. And if you use the link in the description, curiositystream.com slash chainbear, you'll get 26% off the annual plan, which means you will get both platforms for the whole year for just $14.79. And that will go towards helping indie creators like me keep creating. Check it out. 